Uh, hello, New York. It's so good to be back here uh, in person. Thank you, uh, Ron, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining me here uh, for this talk today. So, my name is Shell Woody. I am a uh, supervisor of data science on uh, machine learning at the Tut Institute in Ottawa, uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, the Tut Institute uh, is a fundamental uh, research institute. We're owned by the Canadian government and we do research in areas uh, of things associated with cryptography, things associated with data science, and so forth. Um, but my area, of course, is on data science side of the house, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, our mission is to try and make improvements to fundamental algorithms in data science. Um, things like, when I say fundamental algorithms, I mean things like uh, unsupervised learning, uh, dimension reduction, or, or clustering, or, uh, or uh, nearest neighbor, uh, things like that. Algorithms that you're going to use every day for the type of work that you do. If you're familiar with algorithms like UMAP, that was developed by my colleagues uh, at the Institute. Uh, and popularized uh, as well. Uh, we also do uh, research into uh, relational data, uh, graph type algorithms, things like graph clustering, graph partitioning, um, ensemble models, and so forth. But the thing I'm going to talk to you about today is neither of those. The thing I want to hear to talk to you about today is reproducibility. Um, so today's a bit of a war story talk, right? It's, uh, it's a talk that's motivated by, in fact, this very room. Uh, it was a talk that was uh, that is sort of a follow-on to a talk I gave a few years ago at Pi Data at New York City 2018 in this very spot. Um, I wanted to give you an all-in update, because clearly we're all there, right? Uh, on how things have been going and the various lessons that we have learned um, since we started. But if you'll indulge me for a second, before we get there, I'd like to take a little detour through Greek philosophy. And I like to talk about Zeno's paradox. So, Quick show of hands. Who in this room is familiar with Zeno's paradox? Just a couple of hands, that's good. Uh, for those of you who are not, I'm going to attempt to explain it uh, by a couple ways. The traditional way to explain it is kind of with a setup like this. We've got somebody, a little fancy guy here, uh, trying to throw something at, say, that tree. He is throwing a bouquet of flowers. This seems like a fool there, but he's going to try it anyway. Now, Zeno's paradox says that this can never happen. He can never hit that tree with that bouquet of flowers. I mean, one, he's throwing a bouquet of flowers. Not going to work. But two, Zeno's paradox says the reason he can't hit that tree is before that bouquet of flowers flies all the way through the air, all the way and hits that tree, it's got to go halfway. Right? It's got to halfway first. And then, when it's halfway, it's got to make it halfway to the second halfway. And then it's got to make halfway to the halfway that's left there again, and halfway to the halfway to the halfway to the halfway at infinity. And Zeno's problem with this is Zeno didn't like infinities. Zeno said it can never get there because it's always got to go halfway to somewhere else, and there's no way out of this paradox. That's pretty much the standard setup for Zeno's paradox. Now, I don't like that one. Uh, I don't like that particular setup because I think it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to argue with. I like this one a bit better. This is the uh, setup of Achilles versus the tortoise. You might know it better as the tortoise in the air. And the argument, once again, is very, is very similar to, to, uh, to the first one. It's that you know the story of the tortoise in the air, right? Hare falls asleep at the start line, Taurus gets a head start. Now the hare is going to try and catch up. And Zeno's paradox says that that hare can never ever catch that tortoise. And here's why. At any given point in time, the tortoise is somewhere. All right? And so the hare has to, from wherever he wakes up, track down that tortoise. So it has to get to the spot where the tortoise was at. But in the time that it took that hare to get there, the tortoise has advanced. Not very quickly because it's a tortoise, but the tortoise has moved forward. So now, the hare has to, uh, or Achilles in this case, has to cross the distance that the, uh, that the tortoise has moved in the intro. And while he does that, the tortoise has moved again, and again, and again. And this repeats ad infinitum. And the argument here that Zeno might make is, there's no way for Achilles to ever catch that tortoise. Because every time he makes up the distance, the tortoise moves forward. It's a silly sounding paradox, but it's a topic I'm gonna, re I'm gonna return to uh, numerous times through this talk because I think it's a great analogy for what it is we're doing here. Uh, now, I don't want to hammer this too much to death because this is a talk about reproducibility, not Zeno's analogy. So let's move on and tell some stories. All right. Now, our story, like all good stories, starts with a big event. It starts with failure. OK, it started with a workshop that we ran at the Tut Institute. At the Tut Institute, we, uh, we called a number of our colleagues in, and we were doing a workshop on, I think it was text analysis. Which meant we had a bunch of researchers come in, and we worked on these problems for a couple of weeks, came up with some great results, um, celebrated our results, 
wrote them all up, shared them amongst each other, patted each other on the back, and went home. Very successful event, or so we thought. Until two months later when we came back and tried to extend those results. And that's when we noticed something. We noticed that the, uh, the data, the results that we had, didn't look right. We were trying to embed text data. I think we are doing a glove embeddings of, of uh, text corpus or something. And the dimensions of the data set were wrong. Just plain wrong. Which means somewhere along the way, we would subsetted or subsampled the data. But we hadn't written down anything about how we'd done that. We had the analysis, but we didn't know how we got that data set. And that's a problem, because then we can't line anything up. So we had to throw that analysis away. That was not the end of the world. It's a minor failure. We just had to do the work again. But it was still a little bit frustrating. And so it got us thinking, you know, I really wish there was something that we could do to improve the reproducibility of our data science workflows at the Fed Institute. Now, in a serendipitous piece of uh, uh, coincidence, later that month, I found myself in Cuba uh, at PyCon. And that year at PyCon, there was a tutorial called Down the Rabbit Hole, a 101 on reproducible workflows with Python. And I thought, hey, I just have this problem. I'm going to go and take this tutorial. And it was a really, really nice tutorial. Um, and in fact, it introduced me to something, uh, which I, hopefully many of you have already seen, is something called a cookie cutter. Cookie cutter data science, in particular, is this name. Now, cookie cutter, if you're not familiar with it, it's just a templating system for starting a Python project. So rather than going and copying an old notebook that kind of looks something like what you want to do, emptying the text out and pasting new stuff in, you can fire a cookie cutter and have it build the, the environment for you properly. Cookie cutter data science is a, is, is a template that standardizes a lot of the arbitrary decisions that you might make um, uh, when starting up a data science project. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in this room who has worked on uh, cookie cutter data science, anybody from Driven Data. If there is, come and talk to me afterwards because we've got so much to talk about. I love the thing, but I've also got challenges, and I really, really want to take you to where how we can go ahead and uh, make progress in that. So, 2018, um, uh, we had our challenges with our workshop. Uh, we'd gone to PyCon, learned about sort of all the, the nice ways that we can do uh, reproducibility. We found this great template, and it was kind of an empty template, but we had our own workflows. We thought, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to take our existing data science workflow and build them into this template, and build a nice reproducible pipeline. That's everybody's dream, right? Build a nice reproducible pipeline where everything you do just magically works the second time you do it. Um, and we did, we spent the rest of the year doing that, and we came down here in November and actually presented this as a tutorial. The tutorial was called Up Your Bus Number. All right, and that sounds, sorry, that sounds a bit like a Scottish relative cursing. Up Your Bus Number, but that's not what I, that's not what I mean to be. What I meant by that was bus number. That's the number of people that have to get hit by a bus before your data science workflow is not reproducible anymore. Now, in our case, when we started, our bus number was zero. Hopefully, yours is a bit better than that. But the whole point is, by introducing reproducibility into your workflows, you can make that better. You can keep some of that institutional knowledge around um, in your organization. So we came down here to New York City, and we presented this tutorial. And it went, OK. It went okay because we came in with what I think is the wrong goal. We came in the goal of getting people from the start line of their data science analysis to the finish line of their data science analysis in a way that would be reproducible. But this is where Zeno pokes up his ugly head. Has anybody here participated in a tutorial here or at any of these other events, uh, Python related events? All right, there's a little bit of Zeno's paradox going on here. How come? Because there's always somebody like, say, me standing at the front of the room giving the tutorial. And we get to a certain spot in that tutorial, and now it's your job to catch up. And while you're catching up to that spot tutorial, I'm going ahead and teaching more stuff, which means that you still got to catch up a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And all the time, if anything goes wrong, you're just pushing over the fence, hoping you're going to have time to fix it later. You're pushing all the hard stuff to the end, and go figure, not everybody makes it to the end of the tutorial. Okay, you're always getting halfway to halfway to halfway to where the guy at the front of the room is saying. That's the English paradox. That's kind of what we expected. We've done a bunch of these. This is kind of the thing that we expected when we gave this tutorial. But what actually happened was a little bit different. Right? We came into this tutorial thinking that the start line for reproducible data science was up there. That we'd start with data sets. We'd download some raw data off the internet, do some processing of that, do an analysis, and then publish a result. And that's a reproducible data science workflow. But in fact, a lot of people that came to our tutorial and had difficulties with what was going on didn't even make it to that start line. They encountered challenges somewhere before that in the data science process. It may have been challenges for getting the data to, to be in the right spot on their, on their, uh, on their laptop. 
It might have been a challenge in building that Conda environment in the first place. It might have been a challenge with getting the right tools installed to actually run the Conda commands. It might have been uh, just getting anything to work on their laptop at all. The fact of the matter was is we were wrong about where the start line for reproducible data science really was. And so that gave us a moment of reverence. We thought we were there, but in fact, reproducible data science starts a whole heck of a lot sooner. And that was an important insight. The insight for us was that data science reproducibly is not about getting from the start line to the finish line. It's about taking your collection of data scientists and getting them all to the start line together. Get them all to the same place so that they can run the same things, and then and only then do all the other kinds of reproducibility follow on. If you can't do that, if you can't ever get everybody to start at the same place and be able to run these, these pieces of code in the first place, you're dead in the water. That's when our journey really began. That's when, if you're following this as a, as a hero's journey of, of the story I'm telling now, that's when we crossed the threshold into something new. And that's when we changed our approach to how we were doing reproducibility. So we ran this tutorial here in New York. We learned a lot. It was a moderate success, but an excellent learning opportunity. We were really impressed by this. We were really impressed by the fact that we actually managed to learn more about reproducibility, I would say, in that 90 minutes here in this room than we did in the six months it was taking us before that to develop this in our own shop. And we thought, hey, there's something that we can get out of this. There's something that we should take away from this Pi Data experience, and that is we should run more workshops. We should run workshops internally so that we can get these learnings so that we can get this information quickly, see how real people respond to our workflows, and then see what they're going to do with them. So that was our approach. We said, hey, organization, we would like to run, help you run more workshops, more sprints, more data stuff. And the pandemic really helped us out here, too. Because we all got sent home and we had to work remotely. And one of the things our organization learned during the pandemic is it was a lot easier to make progress on a, on a problem if you got people organized around some kind of event, some kind of sprint, some kind of focusing activity so that their attention didn't wander and go someplace else. And so our organization started running a lot of these focused workshop events. So basically, people in our organization would approach us with a topic and we would help them set up the infrastructure to run their event. All right? We would act as a help desk during the event uh, whenever people had issues getting their content environment to build, we'd help them out, figure out what that is. Uh, and at the end of the workshop, we'd take all those outputs, take all those, uh, those, those products that came out of this, and we'd make an exhaustive list of all of the ways that reproducibility failed during the event. Um, we'd take that list, and we'd pull it back, and we'd say, hmm, is there a way for us to attack some of these problems at a fundamental level? So the rest of this talk, or at least the middle part of this talk, is going to be some of the lessons that we learned. Some of those big ideas that we took away from these large reproducibility fails, from doing these workshops over and over and over, changing things as we went, experimenting, trying a new, uh, new flavors of our, uh, of our, uh, of our framework, uh, and then deploying it again for the next one. And so I'm gonna give you a series of lessons learned, six lessons learned out of that process. But before I do, I just wanna give another hand. Anybody in the room, who's been involved in a project called Kedro. Oh, I really wish there was. If you've been involved in Kedro, or if you know the origin story of Kedro, or if you can put me in touch with the people who know the origin story of Kedro, please do so. Because working with Kedro was kind of a weird kind of dark mirror or an alternate universe experience for me. I felt like Doctor Strange was gonna walk out of the, the wall with a zombie version of me and say, Shell, you're breaking the multiverse. Because Kedro and Easy Data, our framework, use exactly the same language to describe the problem they're attacking. So Kendra went one way to solve the tip of that pyramid that went up, and Easy Data went the other way to solve the base of that pyramid. It's like they were two peas in a pod that somehow got separated. And I'd really like to know what the rest of that origin story is. So, if you know anybody involved in that, come talk to me afterwards. I would definitely love to find out more. All right, so let's move on to lessons learned. Now this isn't gonna be a particularly technical talk. I'm not gonna get into details, uh, although I'm happy to answer questions about how to do such a things, because I've given technical talks on this topic before. In fact, if you go and look up videos from Pi Global uh, this past year, you're going to find two talks given by Woodings. One of those Woodings was me, and the other Woodings was my wife. 
Um, I was giving a technical talk on sort of some of the lessons that were learned here, and she was giving uh, a tutorial on how to use the infrastructure or the framework, the uh, easy data uh, that I'm talking about here. So go and check those things out if you want some more details. Lesson one on using Git. Git, of course, is a revision to control system. How many people here use Git in their data science workflows now? That is excellent. All right, using Git is a great, great idea for helping to capture some of the history around what's going on. You're changing stuff, you're capturing that history, it's wonderful, but it comes with challenges. The first challenge is Git isn't so much a tool as a kitchen drawer filled with sharp but potentially <laughs> useful objects. Okay, it is a tool kit that can occasionally shoot you or stab you, in this case, in the foot. By the way, most of these pictures are generated by like AI things with stable diffusion. I asked it for a kitchen drunk drawer, a junk drawer. Stable diffusion is a very angry system. <laughs> it, it, it really should sharpen the point. But that, that did remind me of the Git experience. Okay, so Git can be difficult. So when you are structuring your workflows around using Git as your repository, there's a few things that you've got to keep in mind to keep from getting yourself into trouble. And the first is that Git is really structured around text. I think Git is good at versioning text. Technically, it can version anything, but it doesn't give you much useful information about what changed. So anything that you do in your data science workflow that you want Git to help you with has got to be in a nice text-based format. Well, that's obvious. Thank you. But two, that text-based format usually has to be human-readable too. And the reason is when things go wrong, in case you have multiple people using that Git repository, you're going to find you're going to have to resolve conflicts. And in order to resolve conflicts, you kind of got to figure out what's going on. And just because your data serialization format can output to something which is text-like does not mean it's necessarily going to help you with that process. So one example I can think of of a format which is technically text but not particularly useful when stuck in Git is the Jupyter Notebook. There are more than a few challenges to try and get Jupyter Notebooks to work nicely with Git. This is a hard problem. Lots of people have done some good thinking about it, but it's something that you want to think carefully about when you're using Git as the mainstay of your version control. The final thing I want to say about Git is you've got to be careful when you get into a multi-user environment. As I mentioned, Easy Data was sort of built to do workshops. In workshops, you have a lot of people working in a Git repo. One of the worst things you can do in a Git repo with lots of people working on it is have large files with lots of little bits in them, say, giant JSON objects with a whole bunch of different little pieces, all in a single file. Because as soon as two people touch different parts of that file, well, you potentially got conflicts because all sorts of little things change. And you don't want that. Git works best when you respect the fact that you want to keep files as localized as possible. So try not to, for instance, serialize your data formats to something which is one giant file with a bunch of JSON sections in it. Maybe serialize it to a directory full of individual JSON files. And that way, if one person's working on this part of the problem and another person's working on the other, they're not going to get those Git files. A lot of work that we did was just coming up with new serialization formats for things that we were doing that respected this property. One more thing about Git, the ultimate downside of Git is that when you're using it, you have to, you have to, you have to teach your users how to use it effectively. Anytime you incorporate Git into a workflow and try and standardize on it, you're going to find yourself teaching a lot of Git tutorials and developing a lot of of onboarding materials. And that is okay. That is in fact a necessary part of this process. So by all means, use Git. Use Git in your teams. Just make sure to incorporate tutorial building and onboarding into that process. And if you use our framework, there is a bunch of that stuff built in, um, which is nice to have. But you're likely going to have to do your own as well. Okay. So great. You're all on board. You believe me now. You're, you're happy to all use Git with all of those sharp, pointy uh, warnings that I just gave you. What's next? Use virtual environments. How many people here use virtual environments uh, for doing their Python work? Excellent. Uh, virtual environments are wonderful. They're really the only way to get things done because everybody knows the system Python and computer just doesn't work, uh, and it's not going to work. It's not going to run the stuff that you need to run anyway. So you're going to have to use a virtual environment some way. Which virtual environment do you use? <laughs> that depends. Now that depends on a lot of things. If I'm going to make an assumption for the rest of this talk, I'm going to say Conda, sort of. Um, Conda with workarounds. Conda ends with workarounds. Um, but that's because that works for me. 
The thing about virtual environment managers is each and every one of those is great in its own way. Each and every one of those solves 80% of the virtual uh, environment problem. But each and every one of those solves a different 80%. And that's okay, because all of us have different challenges. So depending on what your needs are, you're gonna end up in a different bubble in here, and you're gonna have to build a slightly different workflow that makes use of virtual environments. In my case, I do a lot of work, not just with Conda packages, but also with PIP packages, so I gotta be able to mix those. Also, I have dependencies which are not necessarily pure Python, which means I really need to get into that Conda space. And also, I wanna serialize the whole thing to a Git repo that I've done, which means I really wanna start using Conda end on top of all that. But then I want a whole bunch of other things to work, and I gotta find that work for So, use the virtual environment manager of your choice, but use the one that makes sense for you. And this one, and this is a battle, I, this is a hill I am willing to die on. Um, but this is a battle I have to fight just about every day within our teams, and it is this. If you're going to use a virtual environment, please do not use a single monolithic environment. Please do not do con to activate data science. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands uh, for how many of you uh, do that on a regular basis. What I'm going to ask you to do is try and split apart your virtual environments. In my case, whenever I have a Git repo, I create a virtual environment with exactly the same name. So I have only one virtual environment per data science repo. And the reason I do that is because if I have a monolithic environment, chances are I'm gonna to have to go and add something to that environment as I go. But whenever I add something, things tend to get a little lazy sometimes. And you have to troubleshoot that. And you have to try and fix that. How many of you have ever done this? Conda, in, uh, Conda in, uh, install package. Failure, oh, yeah, it hangs, it just sits there for half an hour and does nothing. If install package, success! Right? Do you think the pip actually installed all those dependencies correctly? Do you think it's that much smarter? No, what probably happened is one of those dependencies just got ignored. Because it had to, because it was the only way to resolve the, the problem. But what you've probably done in that scenario is silently broken something. Now, it's probably not the project you're working on, because you'll notice that right away you've probably silently broken something that used to work in this Conda environment. Another one of the projects that you work on. And that's a reproducibility problem that you're gonna find later. And you're gonna have no idea what caused that breakage. So don't do it. Don't use monolithic virtual environments. Do use block files. Now, this is tough, because Conda doesn't do this. How many people here use block files along with their virtual environments? That's great. The rest of you are saying, what is a lock file shell? Cool. What I mean by lock file is this. I want you to separate your environment specifications into two pieces. All right? I want you to have one of them that says, what are the things that I want in this environment? And the other one is saying, what are the things that I actually needed to install to make this environment work? Because practically speaking, to do reproducible data science, we need both of those things at any given time. Why do we need both of those things? Well, there comes a point in time where you just want that notebook that used to work six months ago to work again. Even though the universe has moved on, dependencies have moved on, Condo Forge has moved on, and nothing works with itself anymore. You need to be able to step back in time, find out exactly what was installed to make that notebook work, and reinstall it. That's what a lock file is. A lock file locks all the dependencies and keeps track of absolutely everything that got installed, all 500 packages, when you said Conda install pandas. Now, the other thing you want to keep track of is what are the packages you really wanted? What are the things that you really need in this environment? Well, I need pandas. And that's it. That's important because later on, if you want to install something else, you're going to need to build a new environment. And if you use everything that got installed when you said Conda install whatever that old package was, might not work. You're not needing all those other packages. You're needing whatever it is that makes pandas work. You're going to need whatever it is that makes iGraph work. You're needing whatever it is to make that set of things that you desperately need to do your analysis work, and you don't care what the other stuff is. So when you want to move forward, you need the what you want file. And when you want to go back and make something work like it used to, you need the what you actually got file. That's why you want to use lock files with your virtual environment. And then, using Git, you want to check those virtual environments into your Git repo. You don't want to be dropping in the command line and pip installing stuff, because you're not going to know that after the fact. So you're going to want to make sure that any changes that you make to your environment get checked in. All right. In terms of lock files, what we do is we use a very, very, very 
very hacked-up process that uses an environment YAML file. Environment YAML is the file that we use to specify what we want. Okay, what we want is a particular version of Python. Not that one, we want a much newer version of Python. What we want is a particular set of conda packages. What we want is a particular set of okay, installable packages. Uh, and what we want is a particular set of channels in a particular order to make sure that this build is actually going to work. That's our what you want file. And then we use some make file magic to generate our lock file. Now, make file magic sounds like some kind of hack, some kind of brutal, terrible hack that just happens to work for Shell and won't work for anybody else. That's probably it. But there are other projects out in the world that do this too. Another one of those projects that does it is Condalot. Anybody here use Condalot? It's a pretty cool project that I really, really wish I could use. If anybody here knows anybody involved in this project, get them to get hold of me because I want to talk. I want, I want to figure out a way to make our workarounds work with their workarounds. But Condalot basically is intended to solve all of these problems. It's intended to separate the what you want from what you've got, keep track of all those things so that you can either go back in time and make stuff work or add stuff to your environment and still have it work. It's a really neat project uh, and it's almost where it needs to be to solve all of my problems. Okay, we're using Git. We're using virtual environments. We're splitting the things into what I want and what I actually need. Next thing you need to do is script your workflow. Okay? Right? What do I mean by workflow? Workflow is the set of tools that you use to do data science, plus all the icky workarounds that you use to make those tools work. I claim that a workflow is almost always going to involve both of those things. And the reason you want to script your workflow and not just your set of tools is because I will occasionally change my mind about what tools can do the job. In this talk alone, I said, hey, I had a manual process for doing my lock files, but hey, there's this great project called Condalock, which if they solve my one remaining problem tomorrow, I'm going to start using. But I don't want to have to retrain every data scientist in my group on how we're doing our data science tomorrow every time we make a tools change, because this space in data science moves way too fast. The reason I come here is just to barely hang on about all the new stuff. That's what I get to learn at PyData. Um, but I don't want to have to go back and retrain everybody in our organization how to use a new tool. So what we do is we script the workflow. And for us, remember, all I'm talking about here, reproducibility, is getting everybody to the same start line. That workflow is basically building that environment that everybody's going to use and then running their works. So our workflow basically looks like this. Regardless of how it's implemented under the hood, regardless of which tool choices we use under the hood, we do a make create environment to create that virtual environment in the first place. We activate that new environment via whatever mechanism you activate your environments. And then when we make changes to it as we go, we do a make update environment. If ever anything goes wrong, make delete environment. It sounds like we could do any of those steps manually, but I highly encourage you not to. Because inevitably, if you've got workarounds, there's steps you can miss when you start doing things manually. Don't do it. Conda and Mamba are both absolutely amazing tools. And they come really close to what I need to do this workflow in a reproducible way. But they're not quite there. There are some critical, critical bugs in both when it comes to dealing with multiple channels. When I have stuff from Anaconda proper and I have stuff from ConduForge, trying to make those two things work together requires being very specific about which channel is done when. The main problem inside Conda and Mamba right now that we found is that channel information gets lost as soon as you build that environment. Which means if you don't keep enough information around outside of the usual Conda channels, you can't recreate or add anything to that generated environment. It just won't work. This is a hairy bug. It's crazy, but it bites us all the time in our data science workflow. So, if anybody here is involved in the maintenance or writing of any of these utilities, come and talk to me afterwards. I've got some great ideas for how we can fix some massive problems with these tools. All right, almost there. Four of six. Lesson number four is eliminate hidden state. This is actually reproducibility in a nutshell right here. Anytime that you've got any kind of hidden state, any state which is not serialized in your Git repo or in your version control mechanism, you have got a potential reproducibility failure. The tricky part is finding all that hidden state. I mean, one example is just dropping the command line and pip installing a module. If you don't record the fact that that module is part of your environment somewhere, that's hidden state. Another piece of 
very, very difficult to troubleshoot here at the state, is the Python modules that are on your, say, laptop before you even start the build environment. That's going to affect what Honda, Mambo, or any other of the virtual package managers download. And that state is not recorded anywhere unless you go out of your way to record it. So finding and eliminating hidden state is kind of the main thing here. But how do you do it? I'm going to give you the two tips that have gotten us pretty much 90% of the way there. Obviously, three tips then. Get everything in the kit. That just makes sense, right? That's, that's how you're going to get rid of the hidden state. Um, the first tip I'm going to give you is this one. Develop amnesia. Okay? Because if you do anything that relies on your memory when you sit down at a keyboard, that's hidden state. Okay, so if you can train yourself out of remembering anything, of always having to look into your Git repo for where you were last time and what you were doing, you're going to get really good at getting that hidden state out of there. Would anybody like a tip on how to develop amnesia? Yes. You can do what I did. Have two young children. <laughs> it works every time I sit down at the keyboard. It is amazing. I has given me the magical ability to find hidden state in just about every one of my workflows. There may be other ways to do it too, but I recommend small children that are so darn cute. The other thing, uh, the other test that I use on a regular basis for determining whether I have found all the hidden state in my data science repositories is the old aliens nougat from orbit gut check. Am I willing at any given time to take off and nuke the whole site from orbit? Am I willing to delete my entire working directory, my repository, whatever it is, check it back out and build it from scratch. Am I willing to type make delete environment? Because if I'm not, or if I've got any lingering fear about that, that lingering fear is telling me that I have forgotten to check something in. I have forgotten to capture some state. If you get to the point where you are confident that you're not going to lose anything when you do make delete environment, you've come a long way towards eliminating that hidden state. So do that gut check. Wait, am I willing to delete this? No, I better check something in. And this, this is my nuke the orbit process. In fact, in some make files, I have scripted this make nuke it from orbit. And all it does is deletes everything and then recreates the environment from scratch. Now I said eliminating hidden state is important. And I said in almost every case, you want to get that hidden state into your Git repo. And now I'm going to say asterisk except in a couple of important cases. There are certain pieces of information, local configuration information in particular, that you never ever want to end up in your Git repo because it will cause reproducibility failures or it'll cause all your passwords and credentials to be exposed and that's another issue that will be failures of other kinds which you probably don't want. Um, so local state is something you want to keep out of the repo. But what do, what do I mean by that? Why do I pick on say pass? as an example of local state. Well, one, it's a colossal usability failure. Almost every notebook I get handed from a colleague starts with a line like this. Here's my file name, home best boy client, see on green, check kill file, and then load some data from that place, right? Why is this a problem? Well, obviously, reproducibility failed, because I don't have any of those paths on my system. I mean, like DPS. So like, you know, that's, that's not a thing that's gonna work for me. So reproducibility failed. But second, and possibly more importantly, if you have actual clients out there, Paths can leak all sorts of information. They can leak your username, they can leak your client names, they can leak stuff about the client data that you don't necessarily want getting in the wild, let alone getting checked into your Git repo. So one of the things you're gonna to wanna to do is come up with mechanisms and come up with, 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 uh, with workflows that get rid of hard-coded path names like this. An easy data, we do it like this. We have a mechanism called paths, we just import it from the source module. Um, and we have a bunch of standard locations. So they have default locations, but the point is, they don't have to. By the way, from Python's perspective, this just looks like uh, a, a dictionary. It looks like I got a dictionary called paths where I keep all the paths. Under the hood, it's not actually that. Under the hood, it's a little more clever than that in that it is uh, a file serialized to disk. Okay? And so sending a member of this dictionary serializes to disk. Even better, it's all relative paths to things. Right? You only really have to specify one thing, and that's where like any one of these names is, and then everything else could be relative to it. And so we use the location of this catalog file, this configuration file, as the, the place to make everything else relevant. So this is the set of defaults, but you can change this to point anywhere in your system. All right? And you should on your local system. If you keep big data on a different map point somewhere, by all means, point one of these things to that different map point. Uh, but the special thing about this particular file is 
if you look in my Git repo, it is never, ever checked into Git. My Git ignore file says never check that file in. Always use it, always have it, never check it in. Another thing it doesn't check in is the little file called .env. Anybody here use .env? There's a Python module called .env. It is a way to handle secrets that keeps the secrets out of your notebooks, which is a really good thing to do, and into a file called .env. Now, if you go and accidentally commit that thing in your Git repo, you have undone all the work of getting them out of your notebooks. So don't do that. Make sure you keep it in a centralized location, but out of Git. Make sure you got a Git ignore file to take this local data out. All right, the reason Git, we're using virtual environments. We're scripting our workflows. We're getting rid of hidden state, but we're leaving that local stuff where it belongs locally and not checking that in. What's the last thing we have to do to get everybody to that common start line? To get everybody reproducibly to the same spot so they can start their data science analyses? We have to leave ourselves the breadcrumbs. Whenever possible, if you're building templates and workflows for your, your data science work, leave yourself hints about where to go next. Some of these are really stupid, some of these are really easy. One such convention that we use is number your notebooks. We borrowed this from cookie cutter data science, right? Number your notebooks. One, two, three, how all the words you want after that, doesn't matter. But the point is, when you sit down, you know what order you gotta run those notebooks in. It's a silly little tweak, but it's a breadcrumb. It gives you a hint of where you wanna go next. All right, another thing that we do, our make file. We use a make file to script everything. I never remember what the targets are in my make file. I mean, all sorts of things. We use a self-documented trick that we also store from the data type. Um, that lets us, every time we create a new target in that make file, it just steals the comment from right before that target and uses it to create this beautiful documentation method. So whenever somebody comes to me and asks, what's that command that I gotta use to do that? I say, type mate, it'll tell you. And there you go. I mean, this is an idea I stole from Git. If you use Git regularly, Git status almost always tells you the right command to type next. It is the most amazing help message I have ever seen. So whenever possible, in your workflows, make sure that you leave yourself these kind of red The road so we talked a fair bit about reproducible data science. Here's my final question. Let me know when you're done. In our case, we actually set ourselves a concrete goal, and it was this. We are know we are done with our definition of reproducibility when our users can check out that Git, that Git repo full of our data science uh, for our data science workshop and get up and running with that first notebook within 15 minutes. That's everything. That's environment creation, download the data, whatever it happens to be. They're up and running in 15 minutes. The reason I'm here this year to present is not just because the pandemic's over and I love seeing people in person, it's also because we finally, when we ran an event last February, hit our target. Almost every one of our users was able to get up and running uh, with this workflow within 15 minutes of the event starting. And what were the holy grails? What were the secrets to getting this reproducibility into our workflow? So getting our users to a common start line. It was building all that infrastructure that wasn't even on our radar when we started. All right, we get them to that common start line, we give them a set of conventions and breadcrumbs to tell them where to go next. We eliminate all the hidden state, get that stuff checked in there through a combination of amnesia and fear, and then we let them loose. We don't tell them how to do, in particular, the data science part of their jobs. Because you know what? As data scientists, that's the part we all like. The part we don't like is all this stuff. So this is the part that we ought to get for. And we let data scientists do what data scientists are gonna do, which is good. Notebooks full of reproducible and delicious data science work. Postscript. I did open this talk with Zeno's Paradox. Well, guess what? I've solved Zeno's Paradox. I know the solution. And the solution is pretty simple. You just gotta be super ambitious. If you're worried about Zeno's Paradox flying from, say, Ottawa to New York City, if you're worried about getting stuck halfway, don't book a ticket to New York City. Book one to Miami. <laughs> that way, when you get diverted to New York, not a problem, it's packs you right away. Same thing goes for data science. If you want to solve your reproducibility woes, aim high. Try and solve everything. That's what we did. We started at the tip of that pyramid, and we slid all the way back to largely solving a workflow problem. But the good news is, we just declared that line in the middle, that halfway line, to be our finish line. That's how you solve the paradox. Just be super ambitious about everything. And that's the time. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.